This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Welcome back to this series on how to read the Bible. In our last lesson, we talked a little bit more about the the elements that go into making a story a story or narrative a narrative. And uh, the main unit of narrative is an episode. Imagine you're watching a television show and you're watching a 30-minute program that constitutes an episode. Uh, Typically, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. But normally, it fits into a bigger picture with episodes that precede it and episodes that follow. Well, the same thing is true with the Bible. And when you're reading narrative, uh, remember there are three fundamental elements to look for, to pay attention to. Number one, and jot notes down, take notes, uh, get a pen and paper, or get your computer out, whatever you want to do to to make these notations, but uh, take note of the setting. In other words, where is the pl- where is the place of the action or conflict? Uh, secondly, note what characters are involved, and then thirdly, uh, identify as soon as possible uh, the conflict uh, or the action of the story. Now, Leland Riken, in his book Words of Delight, writes. Pay close attention to every detail of setting that a storyteller puts into a story and observe how it contributes to the story. Well, let's take a look at a passage of Scripture, one of the briefer episodes in the Gospel according to John, and see how that plays out. In John chapter 12, beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 8, John writes, Six days before the Passover... Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary took a pound, uh, uh, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Well, let's take a a look at what the uh, writer John is telling us about the setting, which is one of the main elements of any story. Uh, First of all, we're told that they are in Bethany when this occurs. And what's so significant about Bethany, we're also told for emphasis that this is where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead. That's stated back in chapter 11. You read about the raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11, the previous chapter. John 11, verse 1 reads, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, uh, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. That's where Bethany is, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Also consider the setting of the book of John as a whole, and the purpose statement provided for us in John chapter 20. Earlier, we used John 20 verses 30 and 31 as an example of the importance of keeping in mind the fundamental or the overall uh, purpose of a book. Everything else kind of fits under it like uh, uh, you fit under an umbrella. It's the umbrella under which everything else fits. John 20, verses 30 and 31 read, again, many other signs. Therefore did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. 
So the purpose of the book, the purpose of the, the reporting or the recording of the seven or so signs that are found in the book is to instill belief in the reader. Belief is one of the emphases in the entire book. Uh, some have argued that 98 times in the Gospel according to John that the idea of belief or unbelief is emphasized. And you see it especially in John 11 and John chapter 12. When Jesus asked Martha if she believed in Him, uh, that He is the resurrection and the life, she said, Yes, Lord, I believe that You are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. That's John 11, verse 27. When they took away the stone from Lazarus's tomb, Jesus said to the Father, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. Again, consider this in light of John 20, verses 30 and 31. Why is Jesus performing these amazing signs and wonders? It is so that people will believe that he is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the King to come, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Well, the, the next, we talked about the character, we talked about uh, setting and plot and conflict and suspense. Uh, most stories center around a conflict or even multiple conflicts. I said earlier, if there is no conflict, there is no story. Uh, one literature, literary professor noted that in Genesis 1 and 2, in the reading of those two chapters alone, there is no story per se. What you have is a report. Uh, you have uh, history. You have facts about the creation. But there's no conflict. There's no conflict until you get into chapter 3, where Adam and Eve violate the will of God by partaking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So you might have a news report, but there's no story without conflict. Uh, the sooner you identify the conflict in an episode, the sooner you will get to the heart of the story. Let me say that again. When you're reading a story, any story, the sooner you identify the conflict or the various conflicts in any episode, the sooner you will get to the heart of that story. Consider Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 following, for example. What's the conflict? Adam and Eve, there are many conflicts, let me say that first. There are many, there's a conflict between Adam and Eve. There's a conflict between Eve and Satan. There's a conflict between Satan and God and between Adam and God. I mean, there are multiple conflicts there, all centering around partaking of a piece of fruit that God said, do not eat of it. It introduces the cosmic conflict of the entire story of the Bible. That's what sets it apart, in my mind, from other conflicts in Scripture. Uh, we are introduced to the, the fundamental conflict of the whole story of Scripture, at least in seed form, in Genesis chapter 3. But let's go back to our text of John chapter 12, 1 through 8, and take a look at the conflict there. The conflict is between Mary and Judas, and there's a conflict between Jesus and Judas. The conflict is in the disagreement Judas has with Mary anointing Jesus' feet with fragrant oil. Notice what Judas says, if you have your Bible open still, in verse 5, John chapter 12, verse 5. Judas said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor. Well, that tells you that the ointment used to anoint the feet of Jesus was very expensive. And to be honest, whether I should have thought this way or not, when I first read that, I remember a lot of things in my first reading of some texts of Scripture. This happens to be one of them. It was hard for me to, it would have been hard for me to argue with Judas because it sounds good. It sounded like a good thing to take something of great value and sell it to give to the poor. Uh, 
And if that's all I'd had to go on, I might have had a debate on my hands and not knowing which way to go in that story. But there is a certain logic, uh, because there is a certain logic to what Judah says. But we're not left with just that statement of Judas alone. And here's where the narrator coming in and adding, uh, supplying additional information to the text helps us to know how we ought to think about what happened, at least in this particular incident. John steps in and writes about Judas. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Well, that passage alone changed my mind about Judas. I now know that John is wanting me to think about Judas in a particular way. He's not just some nice guy who wanted to take the money that could have been uh, uh, received by selling this precious ointment and taking care of the poor. That was not what was on his mind, even though that's what was on his lips. And then we have this authoritative voice also. Look for authority figures making comments and speaking uh, in terms of um, how we should look at what occurred and in, in, in relating to the, the conflict. Look at John 12, uh, verses 7 and 8. In verse 7, Jesus said, leave her alone. Now, how am I supposed to think about uh, Judas? I'm supposed to think that Judas should have left her alone. And I think that way, I should think that way because that's what Jesus said. Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. In other words, this precious oil, this ointment is going to be used for a very important purpose relating to Jesus and his death. And then Jesus said, the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me with you. So this is a very important, um, uh, these are very important elements to the reading of, of any one text. You want to identify the setting, who the characters are, what's said about the characters. We're going to deal with that a little bit more uh, in a moment. And, um, and of course the conflict, the sooner you get to the conflict, the more, uh, the, the quicker you get to the, the primary purpose of that story. This might be a good uh, time to introduce another one of these very important ideas I ran across uh, so many uh, years ago. I, I happened to be in a, a bookstore, one of my favorite bookstores in Pasadena, California. It's probably the best uh, bookstore I've ever run across for uh, Bibles and commentaries and books on theology and all. And I happened to pick up a big old used book. And as I was browsing through it, I flipped into one of the pages, uh, into the middle of the book, and I saw something underlined. And what I noticed uh, underlined were, was the advice to learn to compare and contrast stories. That may not mean anything to you now if you're a beginning reader of Scripture, but just try to remember that. Uh, Try to compare and contrast like stories, stories that are alike. Um, in Luke chapter 7, we're told that Jesus went by invitation to a Pharisee's house uh, to eat with him. And I want to read that story to you because uh, it's very much like or similar at least to the one we just read in John 12. And then I want us to compare and contrast the two stories. In John, or Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36 and reading through the end, here's what Luke writes. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclined at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. 
and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the large debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The woman in this story, like the woman in John chapter 12, anoints the feet of Jesus. Uh, again, the same thing is true in John chapter 12. Uh, she took a pound of expensive ointment from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, this is kind of a footnote, uh, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15, we're told something about the hair of a woman. If a woman has long hair, Paul writes, it is her glory. Now, I'm not sure whether it's appropriate to compare women of the first century to women of the 20th and 21st century, but the women I know in the 21st century, for example, my wife and my daughter and my granddaughters and my daughter-in-law and my mother when she was alive and my sister, their hair is very important. It is very important. And they're willing to spend a lot of money to take care of their hair. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that a woman's hair is her glory. And yet in these accounts, in particular, Luke chapter 7, we see a woman using her glory, if I may put it that way, to wash the feet of Jesus. What does that tell you about the attitude of these two women toward Jesus? The story in Luke 7 and John 12 are in stark contrast with the story in John chapter 13, the story of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. Remember that the disciples were arguing over who would be greatest among them in the kingdom of heaven. See, they were too busy arguing over stature rather than humbling themselves before the Lord like the two women in Luke 7 and John chapter 12. In John 13, we should have found them washing one another's feet as well as the feet of Jesus. But it is Jesus who girds himself with a towel and begins washing the feet of the disciples. In the previous chapter, we find humble Mary anointing Jesus' feet with oil, not water, but oil. Now, what do you suppose these two episodes are telling us about the disciples when compared or contrasted with Mary? Before we move into characters, let me emphasize one point here. When you, when you read Luke chapter 7, uh, Luke Jesus informs us that the custom of the day was to wash feet with water and to anoint the head 
with oil. So water for the feet and oil for the head. But in both Luke's account, in Luke 7 at the house of Simon the Pharisee and in the case of Jesus at Bethany with Mary, both of these women are anointing Jesus' feet, which was typically for water to wash. They are anointing his feet with this precious ointment, which was normally, again, feet were normally washed with water, not precious ointment. What does that tell you? You see, there's no explicit statement in either Luke 7 or John chapter 12 about the attitudes of these women. But there is a lot being told to us by the, by the conflict and by the description of the characters and by their action and by the setting. We walk away with this very clear impression that uh, Mary and uh, the woman in Luke chapter 7 held Jesus in high regard with the utmost respect. What my, the point here is learn to compare and contrast like stories, stories that are alike. Luke 7 is like the one in John 12. Or, yes, John 12, because both, in both instances we have uh, people anointing the feet of Jesus. John 13, we have another incident that's similar in that foot, the feet are involved, foot washing is involved, but it's a very different uh, atmosphere coming from the men who are supposed to be <laughs> leading the way uh, when the Lord uh, dies and is resurrected and the church is established. Um, they, were, they were very flawed people that the Lord uses, but we're very flawed people as well. And so one of the points uh, Leland Riken brought up in one of the earlier quotes was that uh, the more we can get ourselves into an account and relive it, the, the more likely we are to understand what's going on. All right, let's take a look at characters for a moment. Uh, when you're reading a story like John 12, just make a list of the characters involved and, um, and then jot down what you know about each character based on that text. Uh, once you've made your list, itemize the description that's given about each one of them in the text. Of all things that could be said about any one character, the narrator focuses our attention on only those characteristics essential for the reader to get the writer's point. So again, let's go back to John 12 and notice what characters are involved and what we are told or not told about each one. Well, the first character, of course, is Jesus. Um, at the end of the story, Jesus says, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. So there's a very authoritative statement uh, commenting on the incident uh, prior. And then there's Lazarus. We know that he's the one whom Jesus raised from the dead. Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. And then there's Martha. Martha is serving. And Mary takes a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus. She wiped his feet with her hair. Her hair, remember, being her glory. And uh, the house is filled with the fragrance of the perfume. What would that tell you? Why would John include that, that little bit there? And not only does he wipe his feet with her hair, but the house is filled with the fragrance of this, per, uh, this great uh, perfume. That tells me that she didn't use a little bit, but she was generous with what she used and that it was a very strong and powerful ointment. And then there's Judas Iscariot who says, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Who was Judas? Judas was one of the, his disciples. We're told parenthetically, in parentheses, uh, he who was about to betray him. That's what else we're told about Judas. And then John adds, he said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief 
and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Every detail is important and needs to be considered when you are uh, studying any story of Scripture. Let me leave you with a few questions to consider. Uh, perhaps you'd like to read the story in Luke 7 again uh, with uh, Jesus eating at Simon the Pharisee's house and the woman who comes in. And notice how she's characterized by Jesus and how she's characterized by Simon. And ask yourself a few questions about uh, any episode you pick to, uh, to uh, work with. Number one, uh, what is the important point of this episode? What one point am I, if there's one point, am I to bring away or take away from this episode? Number two, ask yourself, how does this particular episode advance the plot of the whole book? Like in the case of John 12, how does this story advance the story of Jesus and the gospel? And then you might want to ask yourself, um, how does it advance the plot of the whole story of the Bible? So you're actually starting in a, in a very small frame of reference. Uh, what you're, you're looking at the story itself, then you're taking a look at the story in light of the whole book of John, and then you're asking yourself, how does it fit into the whole story of Scripture? Next uh, lesson, we'll take a look at uh, the story of the Bible as a whole. We'll take a look again at the, uh, the basic breakdown of it into six acts, and then we'll take a look at the whole story from the vantage point of how the story is advanced or moved along by, by means of uh, uh, major turning points in the story. Uh, enjoy your reading of Scripture.